Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Andrea Torres, and I'm the Executive Director for the Alzheimer's Association Capital of Texas Chapter. We're very excited to have you all joining us this morning for our research update on Alzheimer's disease. I wanna thank our partners, the University of Texas Dell Medical School for helping us bring this event to you all today. We have a very full agenda today and we'll be getting started very shortly, but I wanted to cover a few housekeeping things for our event this morning. Everyone will be in a listen only mode during this event. So that will limit any disruptions that we might have during the presentations. And each presentation will have a Q&A time at the end. We encourage you all to post your questions in the chat which can be found down at the bottom of your page, and we will do our best to answer all of them. I'm very pleased to introduce our first presenter. As Chief Medical or Chief Science Officer, I apologize, Maria Carrillo sets the Alzheimer's Association Global Research Program's strategic vision. Under her leadership, the association is the world's largest nonprofit funder of Alzheimer's research and an internationally recognized pioneer in convening the dementia science community to accelerate the field. As a noted public speaker, Dr. Carrillo plays an instrumental role in the association's efforts to lobby both the public and private sectors for increasing funding of, for the disease. Dr. Carrillo oversees the implementation of the association's growing portfolio of research initiatives, including the Alzheimer's Association International Conference which is the world's largest and most influential dementia science meeting. She also oversees the research roundtable, which enables international scientific industry and government leaders to work together to overcome shared obstacles in Alzheimer's science and drug development. She also manages the worldwide Alzheimer's disease neuroimaging initiative, which is a multi-country research effort aimed at accelerating the early detection of Alzheimer's. Under Dr. Correa's direction, the association's leadership in Alzheimer's research continues to thrive through its international research grant program, which is currently investing over $208 million in 590 active best of field projects in 31 countries. In addition, the association has expanded its role in advancing dementia science by becoming directly involved in research. Dr. Carrillo is a co-primary investigator for the association funded and led US Pointer Study, which is a lifestyle intervention trial to prevent cognitive decline and dementia. Dr. Creo has published extensively on early diagnosis and biomarker standardization efforts, as well as on the global challenges to progress for research in Alzheimer's and dementia. She is a co-author of the Appropriate Use Criteria for Amyloid Imaging, which is published by the Society of Nuclear Medicine and Molecular Imaging and the Alzheimer's Association. Welcome, Dr. Creo. Thank you for being here. Great to be here. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome. Uh, Andrea, it's great to be with all of you. And, um, and uh, I can't start my video, so I'll just assume that that's okay with uh, everyone. And I'm just gonna start with um, a couple of thank yous again, also because um, it's uh, too bad we can't be in person, but these virtual events also um, have their benefits. Um, so it's uh, wonderful to have this research update uh, in partnership, of course, with UT Health Adele Medical School. And you guys have such a, an amazing group of speakers today. So I'm really proud to be one of them. Um, so we'll start off with um, the uh, next uh, slide, please. Perfect. Um, I just have a, just two disclosures. First, my daughter is a graduate student at University of Southern California. Um, University of Southern California does receive uh, grant dollars from the Alzheimer's Association as many institutions, including University of Texas do. So just wanted to um, highlight that. The other thing um, to highlight is that I'm a full-time employee of the Alzheimer's Association. Next slide. And so this is just a very quick overview of what we're going to do this morning and what we're going to talk about. You know, the first thing is just uh, very briefly talk about the urgency that we have in order to look for cure for this disease. Second thing I will talk about today is I'll talk to you about the facts and figures, um, our facts and figures annual report, because it just came out two or three weeks ago. And it also uh, had highlighted a very special report that uh, highlights the need for diversity 
uh, and in not only the medical field, but also in research. And then of course, I'm gonna share with you some research on amyloid imaging and in the ideas study, including the new ideas study, which is one of the things that the Alzheimer's Association is leading in order to address these issues. And then we can conclude, and certainly there will be things that I have not covered um, that hopefully um, we will be able uh, to discuss uh, during Q&A. Next slide. So I'll start with um, I'll start with the urgency, and of course, all of you I think know all of this. One of the biggest reasons why we um, actually carry out a facts and figures report every year, which takes us about six months, so a little more, sometimes. So we start working on it just a few months after it's the other one is released, because we have to actually share this information not only with our federal colleagues, our federal legislators, but also with our state legislators. And you all know this because you're in the capital of Texas. And so the importance of this has to translate into more dollars for funding at the research level. We know that this does work because we've seen it work for other diseases. And that's important. Other diseases that have now had a commensurate billions of dollars invested in them per year at the federal level at the National Institutes of Health have actually succeeded in finding ways to slow or stop their diseases. These are diseases like HIV that we thought were tremendously challenging, diseases like heart disease uh, and cancers. And so um, at this time, at this time, it's important for us to recognize that this has indeed worked. Our strategy has worked. And if you see that the funding strategy that started for us in 2011 with the National Alzheimer's Plan has today really yielded incredible results um, with recording in progress. $1 billion today being available yearly. We are catching up with cancers and HIV, which are funded to the tune of about $6 billion. Next slide. In this next slide, I'm just sharing you with you um, also the other issues that we have to face. And that is that we still need charitable funding. Charitable funding is important. And this is just a very quick snapshot of the $235 million that the Alzheimer's Association has invested in research right now in 650 projects across 39 countries. And I know that you're gonna get a lot more information on this from Dr. Snyder, including all of the information around what types of projects are being funded in your community. Next slide. So I'm gonna focus now on the Alzheimer's Association Facts and Figures Report. And what we learned, just again, to share with you that urgency. This slide demonstrates to you the urgency which lies in the number of Americans 65 and over that are living with Alzheimer's and that it is that that number is expected to double to nearly 13 million by 2050. And you can see that the age bracket that's ages of 65 to 74 uh, is in the green, 75 to 84 growing and incrementally people over 85 will continue to grow as I think our medical science gets better and better and enables us to live longer. And live longer, we hope to live in our golden years and not to be impacted by dementia, Alzheimer's, or other debilitating diseases. And we again are able to highlight the gender and racial differences in this report highlighting that almost two thirds of Americans with Alzheimer's are women. And that older African-Americans and Latinos are disproportionately more likely than older white Americans to have Alzheimer's or other dementias. And we'll talk a little bit more about this as well. Next, I think it's important to understand that Alzheimer's kills. Alzheimer's is a disease that will ultimately mean that our loved one will either die with or of 
Alzheimer's. And it's important then here to highlight the mortality and morbidity statistics that one in three seniors dies with Alzheimer's or another dementia. Next slide. And again, this is all very important information to share not only with our legislators, but to understand that research works, that when we see Alzheimer's deaths increase by 145% over the last decade in the purple bar all the way to the right, we do see deaths from other major diseases either remain steady because of great research that has led to treatments, or it actually has decreased that death rate, like HIV has decreased, stroke death has decreased, heart death in the orange in the middle has decreased. So very important information, I think, but gives us all, next slide, please. It gives us all information around the importance of research because it does actually make a difference. This is a very quick snapshot of Alzheimer's and dementia deaths just in the past year. If you see the past year that we've all been impacted by COVID, you see a little bump in deaths and increase in deaths that are greater than the green line, which is the average of deaths by Alzheimer's attributed to Alzheimer's from 2015 to 2019. In the purple line, you see the 2020 bar. It is higher with an extra bump in March, April, really April, May, June, and then sustained. There are 42,000 more deaths attributed to Alzheimer's and dementia during COVID-19 in 2020. That is a 16% increase. There could be a lot of reasons for this, and I state some of them here. And this is um, this file here says inaccurate reporting could be one of them. We have to say that. But the comorbidities that people suffer from when they have dementia, remember, are also comorbidities that increase our risk for COVID and the COVID severities. And I know that you're going to have a fantastic talk from Dr. Siddha Sashadri later on COVID-19 and its impact. So we won't belabor this point. And the progression of Alzheimer's is slow. We understand that. And that might be one of the reasons why it's been harder at the federal and state levels to really get the attention of our lawmakers because it is slower and it's not acute like a cancer or an HIV that once it turns into AIDS can be deadly. And that's important to register and to recognize. But people that are age 65 plus survive an average of four to eight years after a diagnosis, but some can live as long as 20 years. I know in my family, my own loved ones lived between eight and 10 years, both respectively. My mother-in-law from Alzheimer's passed away after eight years after her diagnosis. My father-in-law with vascular dementia survived a couple of more years and he died 10 years after his diagnosis. Individuals who live from age 70 to 80 with Alzheimer's will spend an average of 40% of this time in the most severe stage, which you know that also requires the most care. And the long duration of this disease does contribute significantly to the public health impact of Alzheimer's. And that's why a slowing, next slide, or a slowing of progression especially in the earliest stages, could really be impactful. Caregiving is also important. These are new numbers that in 2020, more than 11 million Americans provided an estimate of 15.3 billion hours of unpaid care valued at nearly 257 billion. That's important, next slide, because I remember that we kept our loved ones at home all the way to the end of their life. And we are a perfect example of people who did this out of our own pocket and had our caregivers coming in and out of the house over the course of eight hour shifts to cover a 24 hour day. We know that two thirds of caregivers are women. I have to say that was the same in my family. One in three caregivers is 65 or older. 
half of primary caregivers take care of their parents. That was our case as well. And one quarter of dementia caregivers are the sandwich generation, which was again us. Um, we have children, I have four children, and yet at the same time, we were taking care of our loved ones. And 41% of caregivers has a, have a household income of 50,000 or less. Important to recognize because um, when you are trying to deal with these out-of-pocket costs, imagine the things that caregivers have to sacrifice in order to keep their loved ones safe. And 66% live with the care recipient in the community. I'm just gonna give you a quick snapshot of new data on race and ethnicity in the report, because then we're going to focus on race and ethnicity in our special report as well. Black caregivers are more likely to provide more than 40 hours of care per week than white caregivers, also more likely to care for someone with dementia. Black dementia caregivers are 69% less likely to use respite services compared to white caregivers. Hispanic, Black, Asian American um, dementia caregivers indicate greater care demands and less help from formal services and greater depression also as well. And Black caregivers are more likely than white caregivers to report positive aspects of caregiving, which means that they are, they feel like they are fulfilling a mission one while they are caregiving. And I, next slide. I think that this is very indicative of our own example in my family. And of course, as we are Mexican American, and so our loved ones did not speak English. So for us, it was very important to make sure that they were home and we did not take the use of long-term care or hospice because even in Chicago, we wanted to make sure we had care for them in their language and that they were able to eat their food and listen to their music uh, and to be in a comfortable environment that they would recognize and be comfortable in. But the use of costs of healthcare, long-term care and hospice is astronomical. And this is something that instead of spending this 355 billion on care, and hospice, which is important. I wish we could say this is what we were spending instead on their treatment. Unfortunately, we don't have that treatment yet, but it may very well come soon. So because there are medications being considered at the FDA and we may very well have answers, at least our next treatment for Alzheimer's this very year. I'm going to focus now on race and ethnicity this special report that was done. Next slide. In this report, we actually did a survey of 2,500 US adults and Alzheimer's caregivers. And for the first time ever, what we really focused on was including Asian, Black, Hispanic, Native, and White Americans. So very important that Asian and Native Americans were included and we oversampled all of these underrepresented populations. The survey just wanted to get an understanding of how people felt overall, including because of the times we're living in now, which is where we're even more sensitive to how people feel about healthcare and trust in systems. We wanted to understand the, the feelings out in the community around discrimination and how that might impact care. Next slide. So here are some of our findings. More than one third of black Americans and nearly one fifth of Hispanic and Asian Americans believe discrimination is actually a barrier. You will have access to these slides but I put a red box around the main finding because there's lots of questions we asked. The main finding highlighted in purple at the top in the header of this slide is also highlighted by the red box. Again, being treated differently because of my race, color, or ethnicity. You can see that white Americans have a 1% answer, Hispanic Americans almost 20%, Black Americans 36%, Asian Americans 20% and Native Americans, 12%. Next slide. So again, I will try to highlight in a red box the main issue that we have highlighted at the top of the slide. 
Half of Black Americans report experiencing health care discrimination, and at least one third of Native, Asian, and Hispanic Americans as well. In this slide, you can see that the middle bar is Black Americans. The green means from time to time I feel discrimination in healthcare, and the purple means regularly feel discrimination. And you can see that Black Americans and Native Americans are both in this way, they are the highest with the next highest are Hispanic and Asian American. Discrimination concerns were actually, the highlight was they feel like they are not being listened to. This is the top concern for almost all groups that we, except of course the white Americans. They felt that they're not listened to. And you can see the numbers there, which are the highest for black Americans, but across the board about 30% for the other groups. Next slide. Again, you're going to get these slides because there's a lot of other information here. In addition, you can go to alz.org, take a look at the website because you can actually download the entire report if you would like to read that special report. People of color want healthcare providers who understand their experience and their background, but many doubt that they'll have access to culturally competent providers. You can see from this slide that the purple is the people that feel um, how important it is that they do have providers that do feel that understanding. And then the teal bars are how confident they are that they're gonna get that. So you can see that everybody pretty much wants this across the board, but there are different levels of think confidence in terms of having this. And you can see that black Americans and Native Americans are the least confident. Nearly two thirds of black Americans think that medical research is biased against people of color. And this view is shared by others, but you can see the black Americans are the highest in the middle at 62%. With Native Americans, Asian Americans and Hispanics coming but even here, even white Americans feel this. A third of them also believed that that was true. So I thought that was very interesting. Next slide. This is something that we do have to address. And I know that at UT Health and the Alzheimer's Association are working together in order to try to change this. Only half of black Americans trust that a future cure will be shared equally regardless of race, color, or ethnicity. And I think that that's important because we need not only to have a trust built with the medical community, but also with the research community, because we need people of all backgrounds to participate in clinical research to ensure that our findings are in fact generalizable to the general population because the US is a rainbow of colors. And you can see here that black Americans do have that lowest trust followed closely by Native Americans, Hispanic Americans, and Asian Americans. And again, even white Americans have a few that really trust that that future cure is shared equally. So how do we deal with this? We have to prepare the workforce to care for racially and ethnically diverse populations. We need to increase diversity in dementia care. We need to engage, recruit, and retain populations from diverse backgrounds in Alzheimer's and clinical trials. And these are some things that the Alzheimer's Association is committed to doing. And I know that UT Health is also committed just as much as we are. And we look forward to working together in order to bridge some of these gaps. I'm going to highlight just last what we learned before we go into the ideas study. Discrimination is a barrier to Alzheimer's and dementia care. People want healthcare providers who understand their experiences, but they doubt they'll have access to them. Black Americans lack the most trust in research clinical trials and half of them doubt that those treatments will be shared. And knowledge and awareness concern and stigma does vary widely across these racial groups. Next slide. Now I'm gonna tell you what we're, we have done in the ideas study. And I'm gonna tell you as a result of the idea study, what we are doing to try to address these cultural barriers in research. What is the idea study? 
The idea study is one study that we have done in, as an organization with many fantastic other investigators. The first and first and foremost is my colleague and good friend, Gil Rabinovich at the University of California, San Francisco. It is a study that looks at PET scans, which are positron emission tomography scans, PET, which many of you are probably familiar with. These are PET scans that actually can detect amyloid plaques, one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's in the brain. And we wanted to understand what a PET scan could do to change the clinical management of a person in Medicare with mild cognitive impairment, which is maybe a precursor of dementia or a frank dementia diagnosis. Next slide. I'm gonna give you a few more details because this was a fairly large study, which is still ongoing. So this is how large the study was. 18,550 individuals were scanned across the country and the median age was 75. You can see the bracket there of age. We wanted 16, 60% mild cognitive impairment and 40% dementia. We hit that almost perfectly without even trying. We had almost 600 dementia practices around the country, 350 PET facilities and completed of these scans, 18,295. In the mild cognitive impairment scans, the bottom numbers there tell you our main results of the positivity of those scans. People with mild cognitive impairment that presented, who don't know why they have mild cognitive impairment, because mild cognitive impairment is just a syndrome. That means you're having a few memory problems, but you don't yet have dementia that interferes with your daily life. So it, they're very mild, they're just memory, right? Not only memory problems, very early days of perhaps a future diagnosis of dementia. But look here, and that here we have 55% of these individuals having a positive amyloid scan, 55%. That means half of those individuals have one of the hallmarks of Alzheimer's which means that half of those people have what we call mild cognitive impairment due to AD, due to an underlying cause of Alzheimer's disease. If you look at the dementia line, almost 70%, 69.6% in the bottom right-hand corner of these individuals with dementia had a positive amyloid scan. What does that mean? That means that those 70% had Alzheimer's dementia and that 30% of them, in fact, did not. So their dementia was of a different type. They still have dementia, right? Because that's a diagnosis by their clinician. But 30% of these individuals did not have amyloid plaques in their brain. That means they do not have the necessary hallmark to qualify to have Alzheimer's dementia. That means they have another type of dementia. One of the most common other types is vascular dementia. That is what my father-in-law passed away with. So it is very tricky sometimes to be able to diagnose and differentiate, especially earlier in the disease process, what the dementia type is. And that's why biomarkers like an amyloid PET scan or others that can tell us the underlying cause are very important and many are being developed right now. But this one in particular is already FDA approved and available. And we are trying to convince the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid to cover this scan, which can be about five to $6,000, very expensive. And right now, Centers for Medicare and Medicaid are not providing coverage. So we did this study in order to try to convince our colleagues at Medicare that it is important to know the diagnosis, to have an accurate diagnosis, and then demonstrate to them that it will change the medical practice. 
of the medical consultation that these patients will have. So I'm going to give you a little bit more of information on this. So our main aim, which you see as aim one, is the impact of the scan on the clinical management at three months. That report already came out and it is the report that I just showed you on the very first slide of, the, of this idea study. Aim two, we are just working on right now, so I can't share that with you quite yet, but aim one, is already completed and I will share with you some preliminary data on AIM-2. On the right-hand side of the slide, you will see that AIM-1 was met. We postulated and hypothesized that we would receive a change in management of a clinical management of a patient at 30% over the course of the study. We actually surpassed that overall 67% of the participants based on a PET scan had a change in their clinical care. This included either adding medications, removing medications, because you can imagine that if you now know a person has Alzheimer's dementia because they have a positive amyloid PET scan, they have amyloid plaques in their brain, a clinician will now give them Alzheimer's medications. If the clinician finds out they don't have amyloid plaques, they have a different type of dementia, they many times removed those Alzheimer's medications and tried to manage the patient in different ways, which is important. A person should be managed according to the dementia that they have. So we surpassed this and have shown this to Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Now, in addition to this 18,500 um, persons that we scanned, thanks to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, who paid for all those scans, as well as the three manufacturers, GE Healthcare, Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals, and Life Molecular Imaging, we also were trying to determine if we could find a 10%, if amyloid PET was associated with a greater than 10% relative reduction in these uh, patients, emergency vi room visits, and hospital admissions over 12 months. Next slide. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that data, and I'll try to walk through it very slowly because, again, we're trying to see if we can change how people react to their loved ones and how often they send them to the emergency room or to the doctor's office if they know what the person has more definitively with a biomarker like an amyloid PET scan. This is just a very quick snapshot of the, the IDEAS cohort, the mild cognitive impairment individuals. We had 8,300 Medicare uh, comparison. We compared them to Medicare patients in the Medicare database in order to create this comparison that you will see. Here at the top, you see the dementia participants in the IDEA study, 4,379 at the top right, and Medicare recipients compared to them were 4,379. And this is just a very quick snapshot of their age, their sex, their race, ethnicity. We tried to make everything as similar as possible, but you will note here that under race, ethnicity, we failed to get the right percentages of race ethnicity that exist in the Medicare database. In the Medicare database for individuals over 65, 20% or more are black or Hispanic. Here, unfortunately, we only had 3% black Americans and we had 1% Latin Americans. Next slide. So we did not do a very good job of getting underrepresented populations. And I will share with you the new ideas study in which we're trying to change this. But here are our results in hospitalizations. The bold number is what you should look at because that's the number that was different between the idea study and control population. We had less um, hospitalizations in the ideas population overall than in the control group. Next slide. And I, you might think that 2%, 1%, 2% are small. But in fact, when you look at thousands of individuals, that is, translates into something very significant for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. 
For mild cognitive impairment though, there wasn't as much of a difference, but for people with dementia on the bottom, you see 4,379, actually there was a larger 2% difference that was significant. And again, hospitalizations are really important. That means that less people went to the hospital from that had results from the idea study than control population, because we, we hypothesize that this is because they know what their, what their loved one has, and they are, they realize that perhaps a hospitalization is not the only way to treat their loved one. And they work with their physician, their dementia specialists more closely. When we also divide up our results between someone who's positive, has plaques in their brain versus someone who's negative, we actually see something very interesting. For mild cognitive impairment, amyloid positive hospitalizations within 12 months were actually quite a bit lower than amyloid negative. Again, when you know your loved one has amyloid plaques in their brain, you hospitalize them less often. For dementia, that number is even greater. You can see here 24% versus 30.6.4. So overall, this is very important information because positive versus negative does have an impact for hospitalizations. And this is the type of data that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid wanna see in order to demonstrate that knowing, even in a, even in a setting without a disease modifying treatment, that changes the slowing of progression of disease, you still with a biomarker have an impact not only on the clinical management, but on overall care over the course of one year. Next slide. Now I'm gonna show you emergency room visits on the other side. These were not as significant except for people with dementia. 47% versus 52% with a 0.85 OR. So confidence intervals also significant. Next slide. So again, important to note that emergency room visits for dementia, but across the board hospitalizations were actually lower if you knew your, per your loved one had a confirmed result of Alzheimer's. Now I'm gonna share with you what we did race and how we didn't do too well, but why it's important to study. Next slide. Race in, again, we did not do well in this study. And this paper is being pre prepared for publication, but was presented at the Alzheimer's Association's International Conference a year ago. Next slide. I wanna thank, of course, our colleagues, Consuela Wilkins and Peggy Dilworth Anderson for highlighting the need of studying the dementia participants, racial and ethnic uh, status in this study. Unfortunately, again, we had very low rates of Hispanic populations. And you can see these, the level of cognitive impairment by race and ethnicity here. A mild cognitive impairment, we had about 50% that were black, Hispanic, 44%, Asian, 53%, and white, 63%. So you can see here that less people were coming to our study if they were black, Hispanic, or Asian in the mild cognitive impairment category. More white individuals seek help earlier on in the disease process, 63%. When you look at the dementia line on the bottom, there, it's the opposite. We see that when we have dementia level diagnosis, black Hispanic is the greatest with 56% and Asian at 47% are much greater than whites. This is very interesting and it actually correlates with the research we see in clinics, which says this, that people of color, Black, Hispanic, and Asian will go to the clinic with a more advanced disease state than white Americans. They wait longer and they don't take their loved ones 
to the dementia specialist until they are full on dementia diagnosis. This is very similar to what happened in my own family. By the time my mother-in-law was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, she was already in the moderate stages, even though we already suspected of these issues were happening and I highlighted them to our family. They kept her very protected and at home and did not want to acknowledge that these things were happening in her. So this is very common to see. And again, as a Mexican American family, we protect our elders and we do not challenge them when they have memory issues that they are starting to display. That's on my own culture. I can't speak for the black or Asian culture. That's in my own culture as a Mexican American woman. In this slide, you'll just see family history. Medical history by race and ethnicity. Again, you'll have these slides and you can take a look at them at your leisure. But you can see that hypertension is very high in the black community in comparison to the white community. And you can see that diabetes is high across these communities as well. This is one of the reasons that we have highlighted as an organization that there is that increased one and a half times for Latinos and two times increased risk for black Americans. These types of other medical histories and backgrounds. Now, what's important here to note is that as an organization and as a culture, our country has not talked about the underlying systemic racism that exists that leads to these types of numbers, okay? So we have to start talking about that as well. And that is another reason why we conducted the racial and discrimination survey that I shared with you at the beginning of this talk. So next slide. And I think that this type of information highlights why we have to talk about it because we need to talk about this as, as not just being biological or cultural, but it could very well be systemic racism. Here's educational attainment, which again is tied to social economic status and institutional racism. Formal education, you can see across the board, grade school levels, who has how many, what the percentage that achieved grade school level uh, or no formal education. High school level, 10% for black, 11% for Hispanic, Asian 6.4, white 3.3. Because high school graduates or college were the greatest for the white population and they were less so for Hispanic and Asian in terms of um, uh, some of the degrees. So it's very interesting um, to see this race and ethnicity and it, it's very similar to what we see across the country. This is cognition. This is a cognitive test. I'm gonna focus only on the MMSC and I put red circles around what you should look at because it, it's complicated. And an MMSC, a mini mental state exam as you can read on the bottom, the top score is 30. It's a very quick and dirty test. Many of you are very familiar with it. The mean that was existed for Blacks and Latinos are very similar and a little lower than the Asian Americans, but this highlights the fact that they come into the study and into our clinical practice more at, uh, with more cognitive decline than our white counterparts. If you can see the difference here, 30 is the highest. So these folks have cognitive problems, all of them, but the white population comes in with higher scores because they come in faster. They are more aware of, of the need to go to the doctor. They're more aware of demanding help. Whereas we keep our loved ones perhaps at home and protected a longer time until we have to actually see a doctor because there's something more blatant. And that's again, proven by these cognitive scores. This is our findings of PET scans, also by level of cognitive impairment. Black, Hispanic, Asian, and whites are across the bottom in each of those groupings of bars. Blue is with any level of impairment. Pink salmon is mild cognitive impairment. On the right-hand side of each grouping is the green dementia in lime green. If you're colorblind, I'm trying to give you also the places where these are. 
So for the first group, the Black Americans, you can see actually that the proportion of amyloid positive scans is actually a little bit lower for mild cognitive impairment in the middle bar for Black Americans and white Americans. That means that there is less Alzheimer's in the Black Americans. There's still dementia, right? There's still mild cognitive impairment, but it's less due, less likely to be due to Alzheimer's than it is in the white population. And if you look in the Hispanic grouping, even the salmon and the green are still lower than the white grouping at the very end. And if you look at the Asian grouping, and it is even lowest. Now, what does this mean? This means that people that are coming to the clinic or to our study, for example, across the country, that the level of amyloid positivity, thus the level of Alzheimer's dementia is higher in white Americans than it is in these other populations. This fits very well with our understanding that the drivers of black and Hispanic, at least, dementia and memory loss could be more vascular or other types of dementia. It's more, not all, you can see here, it's not all, but it is more often a vascular component. And again, I highlighted to you the family history and other diseases. Again, the highest high blood pressure, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes in black and Latinos and Asian Americans. Asian Americans, believe it or not, have a lot of high blood pressure in their families. So this is very, very important information because we cannot treat dementia equally across all groups. We must find out what is underlying that dementia. Next slide. That's very important information by race. Now, again, we don't have the, uh, enough people, but we are trying to correct that with the next study I'm gonna share with you. These are the amyloid PET findings. Again, by level of impairment, the same thing I just showed you. Whites, blacks, Hispanics, and Asians across the bottom. People with dementia in the red line. Look at the whites, the number of positive, positive PET scans with amyloid is highest in the whites in the red bar on the left side, lowest in Asians. Very important information in terms of pet findings. Now, what are we going to do about this? Here's our conclusion. We found that Blacks, Hispanics, and Asians had fewer positive amyloid pet scans compared to whites, regardless of the level of impairment. So that means they are still impaired but they have something besides amyloid plaques and Alzheimer's driving that impairment. Differences in amyloid pet race and ethnicity indicate differences in the underlying cause of the disease. And there are important differences, including educational attainment and comorbid conditions like diabetes and heart disease that we need to understand. And so what are we going to do to understand them? Next slide. Now I'm going to share with you what we're doing about this. We have gone back to the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, and we have asked them to let us scan Latinos and Blacks and ask them to cover the scans with uh, our, of course, our colleagues in pharma, which is Eli Lilly, Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals, GE Healthcare, and life molecular imaging in order to scan uh, and understand underrepresented populations. We are calling this study new ideas. In Spanish, we call it nuevas ideas. Next slide. This is a very quick snapshot and I'm almost done because I'm running out of time of what we're trying to do. We're trying to assess our brain scans in uh, and to, to see how well they can help guide doctors in diagnosing and treating memory conditions in participants with diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds. You can see a little picture of a positive PET scan where you see yellow and red in places 
in which we have amyloid plaques in the brain. Next slide. These are important studies so that, again, we understand what dementia looks like in all populations. And we have to build and replicate our findings from the first study, but make sure we include a, the, a, a majority of diverse population in order to be able to make comparisons and recommendations for future clinical work in these populations. We are recruiting 7,000 beneficiaries this time. Where does that number come from? It comes from Medicare. They gave us permission to scan 7,000 because remember, they're paying the bulk of the study. We will scan 2,000 Black Americans, 2,000 Latin Americans. We will include early onset and late onset disease, typical and atypical presentations, and we're going to try to draw blood. We're asking our individuals to volunteer to draw blood so that we could perhaps in the future save this blood and try to find a blood test that does the same, that doesn't cost as much as a PET scan. We already started enrollment. We only have 60 people enrolled, so it's just the beginning of the study. We're 60 down, 6,940 6, to go. And next slide, we will be recruiting across the country over the course of three years. These are the co-chairs, and I wanna highlight in the next slide, I think, that Peggy Dilworth Anderson and Consuelo Wilkins have joined us. They're in the bottom left-hand corner in order to help us to recruit underrepresented populations. Because we didn't do this clearly, we didn't do this well in our first study. So now we have to focus on trying to do this in this study. So not only are we really trying to understand what amyloid plaques mean and how often they occur in people with uh, black and Latino backgrounds, but we're also trying to understand how do we recruit them into studies? How do we make sure that they're seen by neurologists? Next slide. And that's all very important. I think many of our populations stay with our primary care physicians and they don't go to see their neurologists or specialists. And therefore they don't get to be recruited into these types of studies. So Peggy Dilworth Anderson, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Wilkins are experts in this and are helping us with what we call URP recruitment, underrepresented population recruitment. So the next slide. And the next slide will show you a couple of the barriers that we think we're going to be facing that are highlighted, I think, even in our special report that I shared with you at the beginning of this talk. There are lots of barriers. There's the lack of, on the left-hand side, you'll see scientist barriers, participant level barriers, study level barriers. On the right-hand side, our barriers for new ideas. There's a lack of awareness of the study because our populations are not referred to specialists. They don't ask for referrals and they don't get referrals. We need more information about PET scans in general. They might be suspicious of having a PET scan. We need sites that would support recruitment and we need study materials for the families that are gonna be involved in the decision-making to be culturally appropriate. We have a copay issue. Medicare does still require, maybe if you have Medicare Advantage, may not, may, you may not, but you may not have as large of a copay, but the copay for a $6,000, $7,000 scan could be as high as six to $900. That actually is a huge barrier. And scheduling is very complicated. I'm almost done guys. I know I'm going into my end of my time. Here's what we're going to do about one of those. That's the only time I have to share with you is one of those. And this is a complicated slide. It's called cost sharing. How do you pay the copay? How do you give people copay assistance? Well, it is actually illegal for anyone to pay someone's copay within a hospital system. So this is illegal. Why? Because for us to say we're going to pay or for a company to say they're going to pay, it could be looked at as coercion, like a Lilly, like a GE, like a Life Molecular Imaging can make money on their product. So importantly, we have to ask for permission for the Office of the Inspector General in Washington, DC, the head 
of the health and human services for approval to actually subsidize for us as an organization, the Alzheimer's Association, to actually pay the copay on behalf of the patient. This takes a long time to get this type of approval, but we're committed to reducing all barriers. We requested this in April of 2020 when we got approval for this study. We are still today waiting for approval. They have asked us a lot of questions. We've had a lot of connections with them in May and September and December. And we estimate that the Alzheimer's Association will be paying around $1.5 million in copays over the next three years. But we are committed to paying them. And for current status is that we're waiting for that letter of approval in order to do this. Next slide. In this next slide, all I have here is the highlighting the goal. The goal for us is to eliminate barriers. This is one of the barriers. There are many, but this is a big one and it is not easy. These are none of these things that I'm sharing with you, working with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. It took us a year and a half to get them to approve this study. None of this is easy. It takes time. It takes persistence and it takes creativity because this is not easy. The, but the goal is to eliminate every barrier we possibly can in order to increase access and then ultimately representation of all peoples in our clinical studies, which happen at neurologists office or expert offices and our loved ones need access to that. A very challenging study. Lots of people work on this. And I'm very grateful to all of the patients and families that participated in the IDEA study, the clinicians across the country. I know that UT was full of clinicians that participated. And we're looking forward to new ideas and what we learn about our new idea study. And of course, we're all meeting weekly now by Zoom because we are can't get together. <laughs> Next slide. And lastly, this is my last slide. I have worked with uh, our colleagues at the Alzheimer's Association and our colleagues at the National Institute on Aging in order to create this study, this conference. It's a conference that will address health disparities, that will talk specifically on how we can address health disparities related to Alzheimer's and other dementia. How do we not only educate our community, but how do we educate the clinical community? How do we educate them on their need for cultural competence? So this study is happening for the first time virtually, unfortunately, we hope that next year it is in person, but please take a look at our, uh, at, uh, our website for information. We're looking forward to this uh, and working with the National Institute on Aging. We have two um, very special meetings on the 16th that are gonna be small focused conferences. They are gonna be focused on two populations, LGBTQIA, as well as Native American and uh, Pacific Islander. Uh, so those two populations will be the ones that will be the focus of the small focused meetings on June 16th. The meeting itself takes place then the 14th and the 15th. Next slide. And so with that, I think I will leave you. Uh, I took almost all of my time, so I'm not sure if we have time for questions, but um, I'll hand it back to um, our moderators. Thank you, Andrian. thank you so much, all of you for your attention and for being with us today on a great day of conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Carrillo. I think we might have time for at least one question. And I'll just ask um, as, as the first one that came in. Um, the first question that we had that came in is, what are examples of recommendations for clinicians to improve the racial disparity numbers that you shared? Yes, that's a great question. I mean, one of the things that we recommend, first of all, is making sure that you have culturally competent staff. 
and culturally competent materials in appropriate languages, for example. And if you're making recommendations as clinicians about exercise, diet, keep in mind the cultural uh, backgrounds of our patients, of our participants in research studies, for example. If you're gonna recommend changes in diet, that diet might look very different for someone who is over 65, who is Asian American, or who is Latin American, or Black American. You're not gonna tell perhaps a Mexican American to get rid of as much bread as you might have to talk about corn products. That is where we get more of our carbohydrates. So you have to change that diet recommendation. You have to maybe translate into another language so that when they go home, we recognize that many of our family members are living in multi-generational households. So you have to be able to translate that so that everybody in the family can actually participate in helping our loved ones stay safe and healthy. So these are examples of what needs to happen. And some communities do it very well, but the majority of communities do not. Thank you very much. We did have a few more questions that came in, but what I'll do is I'm making note of all the questions that come that have come in with each of the that will come in with each of the presentations, and then we will do our best to answer any questions that we're not able to get to during the Q and A um, sections. So thank you so much again, Dr. Creo. We really appreciate you sharing the information. And with the other questions that came in, I'll follow up with you about those. Thank you. Great to be with all of you. Have a great day. I'm going to stick around because I'm going to be listening to some of these fantastic talks. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much.